In this video, we'll be talking about RESTful API and JSON, as well as the tools we're using to interact with them, such as curl for the command line utility and postman for a GUI. And then we'll close things off by making a simple Python script so you can see how that works. For the lab itself, I'll be focusing on DNA Center. For one, it's good to get more exposure to it because it is on the CCNA. And also the devices that are included in the CCNA don't directly support RESTful API because the network devices such as routers and switches are moving from RESTful API to something called RESTConf, which is a little bit beyond our scope here. So because of that, we'll be just sending all our queries to a always online DNA Center that you can access and we can just follow along that way. So if you haven't seen this before, this is DNA Center. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna go over to Platform, and then we're gonna go to APIs under Developer Toolkit. On this page, Cisco gives us a reference of all the APIs that we can query, and it, just scrolling through here, you can see there's quite a lot of them there. Basically everything in DNA Center can be accessed through the RESTful API. First thing we need to do is we need to get an authentication token and we can do that by sending a post to this authentication API. This is how we will authenticate all our other queries so that the DNA center knows that we who we are and that they can trust us. So if we want more information, we just go ahead and click this. So it's gonna let us know that we should put the token value in something called x-off-token in a header for all our other requests. It's gonna let us know that we need to do the post method it's going to let us know the URL, and then it's going to let us know any other parameters here. Under responses, we can see the expected response code. So 200 means everything is fine and we'll get a token. And 401 means that we have invalid credentials, which means our username and password is incorrect. To try this out, I've opened up my Ubuntu shell on Windows 10. Uh, curl is actually supporting Windows 10 now directly, but uh, some of the other utilities that we'll be using, such as JQ, aren't uh, natively built in yet, so I'm just going to stick with the Ubuntu shell. But this would be the same if you do anything on a Mac or anything like that. So curl is a pretty standard tool for working with HTTP requests. It is pretty much what you'll be using all the time if you're using CLI to do this. And if we look, we can see that it has quite a few options here. We're going to keep this to the bare minimum. We're going to say curl, and then what you would normally have to do in a lab environment is do a dash K for, for insecure, which means that it's going to ignore a self-signed certificate. But since this is always on, we don't need to worry about that because Cisco has a proper certificate. So instead, what we're going to do is we're going to append the username and password. So we're just going to go user. And then this is going to be devnet user and cisco123 explanation point. If you're wondering where these credentials are, this is actually under the devnet sandbox there, which has a lot of always on resources that you can play with. Just go ahead and log in. Uh, you don't even need a Cisco account for it. You can use Google or Facebook or whatever uh, to log in and you can play around with these kind of resources. So next we need to tell it the request type, which is X. If we scroll up here, we can see that we can also do dash dash request. And this is going to be a post. Now I can just go ahead and paste the URL in, which I copied from the thing. Uh, if you're paying close attention, you notice that this URL is different. This is because this is the publicly accessible sandbox. And this is a, a box where I have read write access to there. So you won't, so you won't necessarily be able to access the uh, API portion there if you're following along, but uh, this is what it looks like. Cisco does have this online, so you can look this up there if you want to reference as you're doing your labs. Oh, we'll go ahead and hit enter. And what we get is a response code. So what we can do is we can go ahead and copy this. And now we can start working on our next request. So we can type curl. We're not going to use a username password anymore because we have a token. So we're going to say that our request is get. And then we need to add a header. And this is going to be that X off token with that rather long string. And then we need to figure out what we're actually doing. So let's go back to our API. And let's grab some network devices. So let's just say get device list. We can see all the different query parameters we can do. But what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and copy this URL, but for our, but to suit our environment. 
So we get a lot of information back, but that's quite the mess. So what we can do is we can pipe this into a utility called, oh, I'll clean that up a bit. There we go. So what we can do is we can pipe this into a utility called JQ. This is not installed by default on Linux, by the way, you would need to install this. And it's gonna return everything in a much prettier format. So let's make some improvements here. First of all, uh, this token is quite cumbersome. It's quite long. And also this token is not gonna last forever. This is going to expire eventually. And when that happens, this isn't gonna work anymore there. So if we wanted to save this in a script, then we'd have to have a way of updating this. I just cleaned up the screen a bit. So what we're gonna do is we're going to just go JQ to clean it up. And then we want the raw output. We don't wanna have the JSON output because we're gonna be using this in a, because we're gonna be storing this value. So we can see that this looks uh, prettier than the last time there. It's not uh, running up our command prompt. And we can see we have the token, which is the name, and then we have the value in the JSON pair. So what we can do is, because JSON is built in a way that we can filter the data easily, I can just say dot token. And basically it's just saying, I want the token value. So now we have this cleaned up in a format we can use. So now the easiest thing we can do is just go ahead. I accidentally closed my Linux shell. I learned the hard way that Windows terminal doesn't have all the shortcuts that I expect, but uh, live and learn. So what I've done is I just went ahead and created that token command again. And then I have replaced the uh, long token with a variable. One thing to note there is I'm using the double quotes there because of the variable substitution instead of the single quotes. And now if we try this, we'll also append our JQ on here. So that's looking a lot cleaner. So if we wanted to filter the response a bit more, we can see that all the data is in an array called response. So if we wanted to filter it there, we just need to call response. And then we need to tell it if we wanted the first value, we would just say, give us the first value. So I could say dot response, response if I can type. And we just have the one response there. If we wanted something in particular, like say host name, I could just say dot host name. Now, if I wanted the other ones, I just cycle through here. One last trick for curl is if we want this to uh, always be able to run there, because I mentioned the tokens will eventually expire, is we can use a Linux command substitution, and we do that by doing the backtick. And then we basically paste in our token finding command and are keeping the brackets and then another back tick. So basically we're running this command every time we run the whole query. It's gonna get a free new token and use that value for the XOF token here. So now I can run this as many times as I feel like and it is always going to have a new token. As fun as the Linux shell is, the more practical way of dealing with things is with Postman. Postman provides a nice little GUI for us there and helps us uh, store all our queries. You can see I have quite a lot. But here we can do basically the same thing as we did before. We can go ahead and send token, or send for posting the token, excuse me. And we get our token value. We can also get some good diagnostic information. We can see the status code. We can we can adjust how we see the, the um, data if we want to. We can have a look at the headers. And all in all, it gives us a nice little GUI there where we can enter in like our username and password. We can tell it what headers we want, like we wanted the application JSON.
I didn't explicitly set the application JSON in the curl examples, but uh, if you have multiple uh, types there or a different format, you'll need to specify this so that the uh, request is formatted properly for the server. Another nice feature about Postman is it allows the use of variables to make our life a little bit easier. So I don't want to get too into the weeds, but if we go to tests, what I've done is I've taken the data from the token, similar to what we did in the curl example, and I'm setting it to a variable called token. So now when I look at subsequent requests, like say our get device list here, and then look at headers, so we can see that the token value is actually this variable which gets updated every time I run the authenticate. If I wanted to, I could create other variables as I please, and uh, everything works great. So if we try this and hit send again, we can see we get our responses. If we had 100 devices here and we wanted to control what we have, we could set a limit for something called page nation. And what this does is if I set this to say two, we can see here that it appends to the end of the query string. And we only have two responses back. If I wanted to filter on say the software type, I merely need to type in the software type I want, which is iOS XE, and send. And we can see again, we have our question mark for filter, and we're just letting you know what we actually expect back. As it happens, these are all iOS XE devices there, so that didn't do a lot for me there, but I could also say and family routers. So I can add as many as I want on here. If you want to see what you can query, you can check the query parameters in the API reference. So we can see I can look at host name, I can look at location, family we just did. And basically anything here is allowed. By the way, while I'm here, DNA Center can also generate code for you. So if we wanted to do this with curl, it would uh, fill this in for us based on the parameters we told it. Postman can do this too. If I click on code, it can generate uh, curl code or PowerShell or Python, whatever you need. And it's just enough to get the basics going for a script. So that's Postman. It does a very great job of keeping all your requests under control there because you can organize things and reference them later. Because if you have a couple hundred APIs uh, per product there, you'll very quickly forget what you're doing. So what we'll do is uh, we're going to close off this video by looking at some Python. And because we don't want to get too deep into the weeds there, we're just going to use the code button here. And we're going to use this as a basis for our script. Um, it's a very basic request. Uh, we can see that we have payload and we don't actually need it. And it's just going to print out the response. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to open up an interactive Python shell. Yeah, you like to use IPython because it offers a bunch of enhancements such as command completion. And I'm just using Python 3 because I have both 2 and 3 in my system, but we should only be using 3 if going forward. So the first thing we need is to import the request module. This is so we can do, um, this is so we can uh, make requests just like curl or postman. Next, I'm going to copy and paste the URL variable, followed by the headers. And in here we have the content type, we have what we're accepting, and then the token. And we have our actual request, but we'll save in a variable called response. I didn't do the payload because it was empty, so I'm just going to take that part out. And now we can print the actual response by just doing something like this. We can see just like with the curl command, initially we have an ugly block of text. We can make it prettier, but we can do something like import pretty print or pp print or pprint. 
And then if we go back up here, we can just modify this so it's like so. And now it looks a little bit more legible. If we wanted to work with this a bit more, what we could do is we can go import JSON. And then we can just make a variable to store information. So I'm just going to call this response dump. And this is going to be json.dumps. And inside here is going to be response.json, just like that. So what we're doing here is we're taking the initial response uh, from a request and we're just putting it to a more agreeable format for JSON. Next, I'll make a variable called data. And in here, I'm just going to say json.loads. And this is going to be response dump. And this is basically taking that data and turning it into a dictionary that we can run. So at this point, if I print data, we can see that we have our response and then we have all the other information in here. If I wanted to, I could drill down on this. So I could say response. And that is going to carve up the first part here. And if we wanted to drill down even more, we could do something like host name. And we can cycle through this way. If we wanted to, we could loop this. So we could say for i in data, and then go print i, what we're going to get is just the response. So we need to go back up here and do the same thing. So we could say response. And we can iterate through the information like this. If we wanted to do a loop, we, or if we wanted to get just the host names, we could go back up here. Then we could just say we want the host name value. And there we go. If we want to do something more, we could go ahead and clean this up a little bit. We could say that the host name has a serial number of plus i see your number i serial number and now if we try this seems i have a typo serial number there we go this just shows how easy it is to uh, work with uh, JSON there. Uh, one of the key benefits there is that we don't have to use Python. We can use any programming language we want. We can use PowerShell or Ruby or what have you. Um, as long as it can talk to uh, RESTful API through uh, some kind of request, then uh, you can use that language, which makes it very versatile and flexible. In this video, we had a look at curl for doing some JSON. We had a look at Postman. And then we close things up with playing with some Python. See you in the next one.